and you folks may begin as you see fit. Good morning and welcome to the Rockland School Committee meeting of Tuesday, July 14th. Um, first, I'd like to welcome Mr. Biggins back to the school committee. Um, it's great to be back to a strong table of five and we have a lot of work to get going on and we appreciate you coming back to help us out, be part of the team. Um, I'll start with the acceptance of the minutes. The minutes of the school committee meeting of, Mon of <laughs> June 22nd. I have a motion to, but there's a couple of amendments we need to make, um, changes to the uh, minutes. Uh, sure. uh, on the uh, first page, uh, under uh, all the list of all the committees, uh, let's change uh, member number five to Mr. Biggins. And same under the number four, changes from member number five to Mr. Biggins. And on the next page over, item number 14, member number five to Mr. Biggins. Item, uh, 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 Let's see, line item 16, um, item to change member number five to Mr. Biggins. And then the superintendent welcomed Jamie. Uh, and it says down there, he, I don't think Jamie's a he, uh, uh, on the page that, you know, said superintendent welcomes Jamie Hennessy, the school committee. He will be here. Let's change it to she, if you would please. And with those changes, like I said, make a, a motion to accept the minutes. Um. Do we change? Dan wasn't on with us, so it is member number five. So I'm not sure we changed them, considering he wasn't uh, appointed yet. Um, well, that's who that. Well, that's his assignments for this year. Right. But so. when we were talking about the minutes for the meeting, and he wasn't with us at that meeting. He wasn't a member at that time? No, he just became a member last week. Okay. Uh, whatever you want to do, go ahead. That's fine. Well, I, I, I would think, you know, because that's going to be going forward. I'm not a one man person, just yeah. yeah. not to make everyone decide, but tell me what <laughs> we all want no, to do. I, I, would, I, I would say, I would think that we want to identify member number five as Mr. Biggins, just for clarity in, in the minutes. Okay, is that, you know, we can, we can vote on that today. Is that, you know, that member number five and then, you know, to say that these committee, these, these assignments for committee assignments, uh, we probably should bring it, they're not on the agenda for today, but we should somewhere along the line, make that change in this, in this school, in this year. Sure, so leave it yeah. for member number five now and put it on the next agenda and I'll reread yeah. through them and we'll yeah. get Dan's name in there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm only being referred to as member number five. I could think. Uh, uh, yeah, but you, you, <laughs> number 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 one, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So we just can we, so can we just put that on the yeah, yeah. Leave it the, as it is, and then you know on the next meeting, bring it up in the agenda for these committee assignments that he that will that will, will uh, assign Dan those committee meetings. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I made the motion. Who's second? There's a second. All those in favor? Roger that. Okay. Do we want to do roll call vote, or do you all just want to keep putting your hands up and I'll keep saying we're all voting? Yeah, that's it. Just put our hands up, I would think. Okay. <laughs> I can see you. No one else can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Moving on to. This is all recorded. It's going to. Uh, Correct. Yeah, they can see Correct. It. But only the one that's talking is the one that's on the camera. So that's why I was asking. Uh, okay. Lucky me to be talking and on the camera. Um, next, we'll move on to the acceptance of the meeting of the minutes of the executive session meeting for June twenty second. Motion to accept those meetings. That, 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 that. Second, okay. Emily. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'll do abstain. Thanks, Dan. That's the four of us. Okay. Nothing under communication, so I'll go to Dr. Cron for the superintendent's report. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, I need, Dave, I need you to enable my screen sharing, please. <laughs> I hope uh, you're still here. Dave, are you here? Yes, I am. Could you, can you enable my screen sharing? Yep, you should have it now. Okay, thank you. There's Alan's screen. Okay, 
So I want to provide an update, sort of an overview of where we are, what our plans are, um, some rationale behind why we're doing what we're doing, the way we're doing it. Um, so I want to give you a general update on our reentry planning. Obviously, our goal is to get all students back to school in the fall in as in-person and uh, capacity as possible. Um, to that end, we've done so far five primary things. The first thing we are in the midst of surveying parents and staff about their re-entry ideas and preferences. We have reviewed five daily scheduling models. I'm going to review four of them with you today. Um, we are receiving, I will be receiving from the principals and the senior leadership team their feedback today at 11 on scheduling models. My hope is that we will select a scheduling model um, by the end of this week um, so that we can begin to plan around that model, particularly in informing parents. We are also developed a list of safety protocols that will apply to whichever model we implement. Uh, the safety pro protocols are quite comprehensive, cover everything from hand washing to how we will move through the buildings to um, how will we will uh, function on buses and so on and so forth. Um, I also, we've been working very hard, obviously, with the budget, working with the town to coordinate our purchases of um, personal protective equipment and exploring the potential for additional transportation costs based on whichever model we settle on. Um, to begin this work, I've assigned um, the large, large areas of work um, to senior administration to be point on these items, um, health, safety, and well-being. I will be taking point on that. Equity and student engagement, I will be taking point on that. Special education is our director of pupil personnel services, Linda Maniglia. Family Partnerships and Supports is Freya Leahy. She is our department head for adjustment counselors. Reimagining Teaching and Learning will be Colleen Forlizzi, our assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction. The reason I put the words increased rigor there is because we have to have three plans. We have to have an in-person plan, a remote plan, and a hybrid plan. Uh, remote learning in the spring, as we remember, um, began in, in March, um, we were finding our way. We then updated our remote learning plans to make them increasingly rigorous throughout the spring. But from the start, they were lacking some fundamental accountability features that are really critical to teaching and learning. For example, grading. Grading is a very important aspect of teaching and learning. Um, and if you ask this to student, which assignments they're going to complete, they're going to complete those assignments that are graded. So part of, part of um, re-envisioning teaching and learning for the fall is going to be a more rigorous remote learning program. Um, this program needs to be looked at by level, obviously. So the, the um, teaching and learning will look a little differently at the high school than it does at the middle school and it does at the elementary school. So when I say that Colleen Forlizzi is in charge of reimagining teaching and learning, obviously she is working hand in hand with the principals and they are also leading this process. Personnel and staff support will be Jane Hackett, our business administrator. Professional learning will be Colleen Forlizzi. Professional learning refers to the professional development of our faculty and our staff. That is everything from <sighs> training how we are going to wash floors and bathrooms and desks to how are we going to become more effective teachers of remote learning. So Colleen has a lot underneath this umbrella. It is professional learning. Also included in professional learning is going to be learning offerings that we are going to offer to parents. One thing that I've heard um, over the summer so far is that parents would like some help with um, working with their kids at home. They would like to better understand social emotional issues um, mm -hmm. from a teaching and learning standpoint. And as a school district, we can provide them with some teaching, um, op some learning opportunities. And so that will also be part of our professional learning goal. And then finally, technology 
which is being overseen by Colleen and Jane. Technology obviously is hardware and software. Um, Jane will look at all of these through, through our financial, financial lens and Colleen will be looking at our technology purchases through an instructional lens. At the same time, we have Tim Wells, who is our director of technology, and we have Lisa Ryan, who is our director. She's not a director, but she is in charge of um, teaching instructional um, software support. So she helps our teachers better use the software. She runs training programs for our teachers. So she will also be um, a central person in the technology uh, assignments. The next thing I wanted to just go over was in a little more detail now, here are the specific areas of work that we have undertaken so far and that we are undertaking Alan, now. Alan. Yeah. Now, you, you skipped building and maintenance, the last bullet. Oh, did I skip a bullet? Yep. We should go back. Yep, school facilities. Sorry, I didn't mean to skip for Mark Shaw, our director of facilities, who's also working with Jane Hackett. And obviously Jane is in charge and, and and works with each one of these things because she is our chief financial officer. Well, she's our financial officer. And um, so she is monitoring the um, costs of all of our facility needs. Thank you, Jane. Dr. Cron. Yes. I feel like number nine is also very important to communicate with the community of the steps that we're taking, that we will be taking um, when the students go back, hopefully go back to school in the fall. Um, I will be covering that in a, in a little bit. Okay, just so the parents feel comfortable and that they know the school is doing everything that we can possibly do to sanitize. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Phase one, uh, the first thing we need to do is to identify our remote learning model, our hybrid remote learning model. What is that model going to look like? We have looked at various teaching and learning schedules and have begun the discussions. And again, as I said earlier, at 11 today, I will receive feedback from the senior leadership team, then I suspect we will be zeroing in on a model um, by the end of this week. I will be going over those models in this presentation very shortly. We need to identify a formal process for identifying gaps that exist, whether they were caused by COVID or just caused by the absence of being in school. There are gaps that now exist in students' backgrounds and education and we need to identify them when they return and we need to have a plan for um, filling those gaps. I use the word formal in this sentence for a reason. I expect there to be accountability measures in place. When we identify a gap, we're not just gonna identify it and say, there it is, what are we gonna do about it? We're gonna make a plan and we're gonna follow through on the plan and someone will be responsible for following through on that plan. So I'd like a formal process in place for identifying gaps. Next. We have a district safety protocol. Um, I don't want to call it a policy, but set of procedures that is um, extensive, that again, covers everything from hand washing to how we will move around the building, um, to what we will do if a case emerges in one of our schools. All of that is covered in our district safety protocols. That is fairly complete at this time and is being vetted by the senior leadership team by um, our nurse, our head nurse, Kathy Ryan, and will eventually be completely vetted um, by Town Hall and Delshawn Flip, our health agent. Next, we need to ensure delivery of special education services. This is obviously a very large area, um, but we, it's, it's, a, it's a top priority. We need to decide how we're gonna do it, how we're gonna deliver services, whether we're in remote, um, in-person, or hybrid. We need to pay a special, special attention this year, I believe, to fostering a culture of equity, diversity, and inclusion in the Rockland Public Schools. I think everyone is well aware um, that we are living in a time historically that is comparable perhaps only to that that we experienced in the 50s and 60s, um, a cultural awakening, so to speak. Um, as a school district, I feel it's incumbent upon us to talk about these issues as a school district from a staffing standpoint to a curriculum standpoint. Um, we need to foster a culture of equity, diversity, and inclusion in our school district. We experienced some 
conflicts, um, some student conflicts that came up in, in February that were around race. Um, I feel that it's important that we take these conversations on head on and um, that we engage the community, we engage our parents and we engage our students in difficult conversations around race, equity, diversity and inclusion. Our um, scope continued is we need to ensure adequate software, hardware and PD for faculty and staff as well as for students. We realize now the importance of remote learning and you cannot learn remotely if you are lacking a device or if you are lacking the internet, access to the internet. So we need to ensure that those are present. And secondly, we need to improve our skills as remote teachers um, so that we can be more effective teachers for our students when they are home. And again, a teacher cannot teach remotely if their technology is outdated. So that is a top priority. Number six, we need to address the challenges that are going to emerge when personnel or students are unable to return to school for whatever reason. So we need to have plans in place for how we are going to address that. Will we have teachers who are strictly teaching remotely? Will we have teachers who are strictly teaching um, in person? I will say on this front, my vision for teaching and learning in the fall, whether it's remotely or in person, is that teachers will be in the school each day. They will be teaching from their classrooms. You will see in our remote teaching and learning plan, there will be an increased attention to, um, to um, in-person instruction, to doing, um, um, the word is escaping me right now, um, instead of just having it be remote that the teachers will be teaching live classes online, um, synchronous, my apologies, but we will have synchronous experiences on a daily basis with our students. And obviously that is a huge administrative challenge for how to make that happen from a staffing standpoint, but it's a challenge that we need to address. Professional learning and parent learning is another area that we need to address. We need to begin the year um, with our teachers and staff ready to welcome our students back and to, to take on remote learning in a new way. And we need um, for parents to have the skills that they need and the supports that they need from the schools to make this work as well. And we need to expand and create our new, new family partnerships. As we've talked about a great deal over the past number of years, we have a growing Brazilian population in town. It's important that our families are connected to the school that we are able to connect and support their children and families. And I feel um, currently we do not have a diversity committee in the district. I think we need a diversity committee either on the district level or on the building level. Um, but I would like to, just as I meet on a monthly basis with Michelle Kippingham about special education as she's the president of the PAC, I feel it's important that I meet with the chair of the diversity committee on a regular basis so that we begin to address issues before they arise, as they arise, um, but we're engaging in these conversations in a proactive manner. So expanding and creating possibly new family partnerships. And then finally, everyone should know that our plans, all three plans are due to the Department of Education by July 29th. So we are on a very tight time, time schedule. Our plans should be, will be completed by the 29th at the latest. I will tell you, with that being said, that we are being encouraged by the Commissioner of Education to hold off announcing our plans until early August. I believe now some districts have already released plans far ahead. Um, those districts are now going back and having to alter their plans based on state guidance. The later we wait to to um, create our plans, the more information we have, um, and the more information we have regarding cost. Every single one of these issues that I have raised here have costs associated with them. Some of these costs we've had for every year leading up till now, some of these costs are new, but they all have a cost. And the later we wait, um, even, in this, even in this crisis since March, what is proven time and time again is the longer we may wait to make our decisions, 
the better those decisions end up being from a financial standpoint and I would assume from an educational standpoint, although now we're in summer mode. So we are not, we are not trying to go slow necessarily, but at the same time, there is no benefit to us rushing our plan out the door. Um, okay, when we get the plan, just, just to finish this one point, when we get the plan drafted with the senior leadership team, the next um, phase with the plan will be to vet it, vet it with, a, with a task force that includes parents, students, and teachers from around the district so that we get input on this plan from everyone, and, include, and that's in addition to the survey that we've put out. So we want the final plan to have been vetted by the community um, so that everyone is on the same page. And I think I interrupted someone. No, I, I rudely interrupted you. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you. I just wanted to make a quick point. I think, I think uh, all of that is sound, and I think that makes really good sense as far as a, a slow and thoughtful approach um, as, as things begin to unfold, as they are quite unpredictable. But I just wanted to make a quick point that I know for student families and for faculty and staff that um, uncertainty can be difficult. And, uh, you know, not knowing how, how or what the rollout to school will look like is hard for folks that not only attend the schools, but work there. And I just think it's important to uh, thank everybody for their patience and understanding um, and knowing that, you know, there's a lot that's still yet to be found out and that really everyone's just doing, doing our best to try to uh, make the right decisions as they're presented to us, as they are quite unpredictable in the weeks to come. But I know the situation is not perfect for, um, you know, student families and for, and for staff. Yeah, and yeah, I, I would also think that you probably got to receive some additional guidance from Jesse. Correct. Yeah. We're receiving updates. We're expecting to receive an update from the CDC this week as well which governs a lot of what we're talking about. We're also expecting updates from the Department of Education. Um, so yes, there's still information coming in. So I'll just move ahead. Let me talk briefly about four of the models that we looked at, um, just to give the public and the committee a chance to understand some of the work that we've been doing. We looked at this first model, which is known as the Palo Alto model. It has half the students in two days a week, um, for example, Monday and Thursday, and the other half, Tuesday, Tuesday and Friday, with one student day off in the middle. Um, that is called the Palo Alto model. Some of the pros, um, there's, it's fairly, uh, there's pretty good continuity with in-person services, no long breaks. Um, it gives one dedicated day for PD, for deep cleaning, and um, to provide additional support for at-risk students. Um, but uh, pro also is that families would require daycare for only three days per week. Cons are that we're really only seeing students um, two days per week and students with disabilities may have reduced access to inclusion classes and, um, and services disrupted. And it's all the inconsistent schedule could be harder for staff and families to acquire daycare. So that is one model that we looked at. The second model that we looked at was in-person one week and remote learning the next. So it has students going to school one week, then the following week they're doing remote learning and vice versa, it goes on and on. Um, the, the upside to this is medical, that, that it gives us a longer period of time in between visits, so it could help with student incubation periods. It's a little more predictable and possibly easier for families to arrange daycare. Um, the downside of this is that there's a longer period of time in between learning sessions for students and in-person learning, so it could be difficult for struggling students, and it exposes our secondary staff to a large number of students. The next model that we looked at was um, pre-K to five, those students coming to school five days a week, all day long. Um, that would require us to reassign elementary students to the middle school and the high school. And the middle school and the high school would be mostly remote with um, weekly in-person advisory or homeroom sessions. Um, the pros of that, our youngest students would attend school every day, would help with daycare needs, um, would keep the middle school, high school students home so it would free up space. And the youngest students um, seem to be less affected by COVID. COVID, so it reduces exposure. 
The downside is, would elementary students then be ready if we needed to pivot and go remote because we had um, a resurgence of, of the virus? Uh, we would lose our economy of scale and have fewer staff to cover in different buildings. There's no playground access to secondary sites. Our limited in-person sessions for middle school and high school, it would have a, a definitely substantial impact on secondary extracurriculars. And we would um, have issues among staff members, I think of feeling as though one were teaching in person and one were teaching directly remote. Um, I'll be honest, no one liked this model, but it is a model that we looked at, so I'm sharing it with you. There was another model we didn't like that I'm not bothering to share as well. Uh -huh. um, and the, uh, the next model that we looked at is um, pre-K to 12 every day for half the day. So that would get every student in the building every day for half the day. So half of the pre-K to 12 would attend in the morning, then go home and do remote learning in the afternoon. Then the students would do, the students who did remote learning in the morning would come into school for the afternoon. So this pros of this would give students with teachers every day. Um, lunches could be grab and go for both sessions. So it solves cafeteria overcrowding issues. The downside is it could double our transportation budget. Um, it's difficult to keep clean between student groups, but if we did like an eight to 11 and then a 12 to three, we'd have an hour in between. So maybe we could get everything done in that period. Um, but it would be a lot of people in and out of the buildings per day. Um, but that is another model that we looked at. Um, I will tell you that I think that the senior leadership team has a preference for this model. Um, I think the senior leadership team seems to be leaning this way. They particularly like the idea of seeing our students on a daily basis. They feel that, um, and I agree, that the relationships that are built between the teacher and the student are of the utmost importance for all students, but especially for our high needs students who I feel have been, are being um, perhaps disproportionately affected um, by the school shutdown. So seeing the kids every day is, is, a, is a positive. I don't know if the school committee had any questions about the models that we looked at, um, but again, I'm gonna get the feedback from the, from the leadership team today at 11. We've talked a lot about the word consensus and the word consensus, as you know, you know, implies that we all come into an agreement. We may not love all aspects of the plan. In fact, I don't like any of the plans. My favorite plan would be for all of us to return to school normally. Um, but the fact is we're living with a health crisis that's killed 110,000 people and it's real and it's resurgent in areas. And we've just seen California, for example, who has had to go in reverse and shut their state back down and they will not be having school in the fall. So it makes a great case for wearing masks and for us to take this very seriously, in my opinion. School committee, because I can talk a dog off a meat wagon. Do you have anything that you would like to say or ask? Yes. Dr. Kron, uh, thank you for sharing the models. I think it is probably a lot of work to go through and vet the pros and cons. Um, just this model that you have up on the screen number four about the half days. Um, the other models you did in, inject the family aspect um, and the daycare aspect into the pros and cons. Um, and we don't see that here, where I think number four, half day, we do have to um, involve or take into account the um, home aspect and the needs of daycare when the um, kids are remote the second half of the day. So I don't know, I'm guessing that would be more of a con um, for this model that there has to be family logistics um, to the other portion of the day that may have an impact. I agree. I think there's family impact for many of the models. Right, exactly. Yeah. Anyone else want to? add anything. What's your preference? Currently, I came into it um, preferring the week on week off um, because logistically I can see it um, being done horrible um, for kids. Yeah. I think I've come around to feeling as though we want to see the kids every day. Yeah. So my preference today, if I had to make a decision or my decision to make alone, 
I would, I would lean with the um, every day, half day. We see the kids every day. Um, it's very challenging. All of the models are challenging for families. We understand that. The number of challenges on the school side are, are um, equally long. Um, how we're going to staff this remains a mystery. Um, and again, keeping people safe is, is our first priority. So how we keep people safe in our, any of these models is a big question as well. So um, in answer to your question, Mr. Mills, I would, I would, if I had to make a call right now, I would be recommending this model. Just to, just to say, Alan, I think you and I talked about it at one point that um, all of the models are terrible. I mean, based upon what the reality that we know that we all grew up in, that we've all raised our children in, in right now, we never could have envisioned any one of these four scenarios. There, you know, a year ago, we would have looked at these and said, these are absolutely nightmare awful scenarios. And to have to pick, be, pick one is incredibly difficult uh, for this committee, for any committee, for any school district. And I just hope folks can understand that it's easy to pick any one of, them, any one of these apart and to point out any one of the um, problems with them, because there are problems, both from, as Jamie pointed out, from you know, parenting and daycare home sense to administrative um, you know, application of these in the actual school buildings. None of these are good options, but you know, with an uncertain future and a scary future, um, it happens to be on this day now to, to, to consider these and to pick the one that's most appropriate for our committee. So I, I hope the community, the community of Rockland can be understanding of the difficult time that we're in and the difficult choices that are to be made. And um, I know all of us are gonna be making them for the right reasons. When do you want the decision made, today? No, I, I want, again, I want to hear feedback from, I want to hear feedback from the senior admin today. Um, my plan would be to present, to present you with, you know, our first choice, our second choice, our third choice, and to engage in more conversations, and then to engage in some conversations with the community as well, and, and obviously the survey data, yeah, um, to look at that. Um, I will say the survey data, you know, the survey data, is all over the place. You have um, really a whole range. There's nothing is jumping out as this is what everyone wants. And I think it just points out, as Mr. Biggin said, you know, how um, difficult a, a decision this is. It's like um, choosing between four things that you don't really want to do, but right. you have to pick one. It's so. particularly now that after this you know, pr presentation, hopefully we have a, a a fair amount of parents and uh, viewing this. This is on WRP yesterday. And after this discussion, seeing what kind of feedback we might be getting back from uh, uh, the, the, the town. The people in yeah, the and I just them. encourage people to remember that we have to pick one. So, okay. you know, if, if you have a real big problem with a plan, which is completely understandable, um, just remember we, we have to pick one. Right. Um, we're trying to come up with a plan that gets kids in school um, as often as possible. So I think that this is where the having them in school every day is so important. So for example, some students may not have done as well with remote learning as others, but if you're in school every day and you need help with that math work, um, you're going to have the teacher with you every day to help you with that math work. So, it's a big difference than trying to connect with a teacher remotely right. and see them in person. So um, well, I think there's some pros. What, what happened? Well, excuse me. Go ahead, Jamie. No, I was going to say, um, I think Dr. Cron, you said that, you know, we are picking a model, but it is not for the full year. Like we would, we could be pivoting back to fully in person or even back to fully remote, depending on how right. COVID goes for the rest of the year. So um, I think it's, um, important for the families and for everyone listening to know that this is not forever. It's not for the full year. It could be for the full year. It all is dependent on how um, our state and our country continues to um, address COVID, right? So uh, I think that's important to, to let people know that it could change. Yeah. Even if you pick a model and we're back in school for a couple of months, <laughs> we could be going one way or the other. So. Um, hopefully you know, families are uh, acceptable to, to what is agreed upon by leadership in the town. So just another quick uh, comment and thought. 
Um, you know, we, we were spending a lot of time as our, a, lot of, a lot of folks, a lot of districts talking about how to reopen our schools. And I'm sort of my first meeting back and maybe you guys have been discussing this, I don't know. Um, but I think a lot of things, and Alan, you did reference a little bit earlier on, so it lends me to think that maybe it has been discussed, but I think it's equally as important to talk about what happens, contingencies of what happens if someone gets sick in our buildings, the staff, the students, right. what happens after the fact if we open and something happens as much as it is opening up. So can you tell me a little bit, has there been a lot of discussion about that as far as what happens if there's a suspected case or if there is a small breakout, how the district would react to that? Is that something we, we've explored as of yet? Absolutely. So final decisions on the procedures haven't been made yet, but what I will tell you is that they're in our safety, in our safety plan, there's very, very specific language. If a student or a faculty member is found to have COVID or a related family member, we will immediately kick into gear with our partnership with Town Hall and Delshawn Flip, our health agent, who will notify um, the state level and will document the case. We then will initiate on our end, the only part that hasn't been decided is, do we close the building? Do we close the wing of the building? Is it a case by case basis? Um, but there will be a thorough cleaning of the area and most likely the building after the, a case is found. And then we will initiate contact tracing. But again, what this, this is our partnership with the town and we will have a very strict uh, health protocol in place. Um, and again, I have that, we have that plan um, written out. It just needs to be vetted by, um, needs to be vetted by a lot of people, including the health agent. Um, the plan is with our safety plans that they're completely vetted by the town, um, by Delshawn Flip, our health agent, and implemented through Kathy Ryan and our head nurses and our principals. Um, so in answer to your question, yes, we have a draft of our, of our procedures. They will be locked in and finalized um, so that we will be able to tell the public exactly what we are going to do if we have a case. Um, again, if those policies right now, if, if we were in school, my, my answer to that would be if we had a case at Jefferson, um, Jefferson would pivot to remote learning, students would go home, the building would be cleaned, and then we would reopen and contact tracing would be put in place. For, for those students and people who were, who were perhaps exposed to that student or teacher who had COVID. So, um, and that's, that's my current answer to your question, but yes, we will have very clear documented policies and procedures in place um, in case there is a case found, which I anticipate there will be. Yeah. Um, what about sick time for teachers? You know, they go to quarantine for 14 days. There's a special, um, there's special language that's included under the, I believe it's part of the CARES Act, but if not, it's just legislation related to COVID that um, there's a specific form of leave that's in the FMLA um, umbrella that has to do with quarantining and uh, time off from work due to COVID. So we will obviously honor and recognize that okay. and work with our staff. And what about for students? Because if they have to quarantine for 14 days, then they're over their student absent policy as right. well. So another part of the, the, the uh, safety plan includes a look at our attendance policy. And our attendance policy is going to have to be relaxed, for lack of a better word. Um, we're going to have to deal with these things on a case-by-case -case basis. And the state, I believe, is going to allow us to do so. They have spoken in very broad terms so far about that issue. They've just said that schools should relax, schools should, you know, but relax does not translate into, uh, that's not a good verb for me. I need us to have actual, what are we gonna do? Um, so in answer to your question, yes, we will have, um, we will be understanding with families and with kids should COVID be an issue. Um, about and it also goes season. back to this idea of whether or not people are, if kids are gonna choose to not come to school because of COVID, we, we have to educate them as well. So they would, they would be part of our remote, oh, wow. remote learning classes. Quick so question. if they're home quarantining for 14 days and they've just been exposed, are we having them remote learn while they're home? Absolutely. Yep. And if they're home for say a flu, we're heading into fall, we're heading into winter, into flu season. If they're home for that, 
does the same attendance policy go? Essentially, what, what, what they're saying is, <coughs> saying is this is going to be a very strange year and attendance is most likely going to be different. Um, the law as it reads right now, if someone is kept home from school because they're sick, without a doctor's note, we're supposed to call that unexcused. Mm -hmm. This committee and this town has set a policy that says, listen, if mom calls and says, John is sick and staying home, that is an excused absence. So we have, we're sort of made a decision uh, on the local level to treat, to treat um, attendance a little differently than is recommended on the state level. But that's because everyone doesn't take their child to the doctor when they're sick. And I'm not going to punish someone who doesn't have access to their primary care physician every time Johnny gets a fever. So um, we've made decisions already on the local level to, to recognize our population and, and take care of our families. And I think we will continue to do that um, as it's reflected through the COVID situation. But you're right, we're gonna be dealing with regular flu and cold. And I think, you know. Right, and I think we're going to be asking for the parents to sort of be a little bit more vigilant on keeping their kids home. I'm the mom that always is, oh, you're fine, keep going, you're fine, keep going. Um, I, I think like we're not mother. gonna get, <laughs> what, Mr. Mills? Sound like my mother. Right, no. yeah, I work in hospitals, you, you're fine, keep going. <laughs> But I think that we can't play that game this year. I think that parents are going, and the other side is you're not gonna probably run off to the doctor with your child anyways, because you don't wanna go into the doctor's office. So I think there's gonna be a lot of sort of question in the air as far as parents trying to make the call of, you know, my son or daughter doesn't quite feel well. I don't feel comfortable to send them today. If they're already not feeling well, they probably shouldn't be in school because now their immune system is down and that's setting up for another issue. So um, I, as, as long as they know we have their back and um, teachers as well, that our goal is safety for students and our faculty. Yep. So quick question. Um, and we are in this yeah. sort of odd time and Go ahead. This, this brings up a broader question for me. I, I know um, that we sort of look for guidance on pretty much everything we do policy-wise in the schools to the handbooks. Um, and Alan, you said earlier, based on the issue of illnesses, that this is going to be a weird year and we're going to have to sort of just find our way a bit as we go. I, I imagine that, you know, obviously this year's handbook has already been approved and is would have been handed out. I imagine that there may be several things throughout the course of the school year that may need to be changed or may need to be sort of flexible, maybe that we're not even anticipating yet. And I'm just wondering how that will reconcile with the handbook. Will we be able to or will we need to be able to make um, adjustments to the handbook as needed as we, as we go along? Because I imagine that there may be some challenges even outside of illness that this current pandemic situation um, will bring us that we may not even be anticipating right now. So that's a good question, but I will say that the, the student handbook is a legal document and it's signed by every parent of every child in the district. As a high school principal, it was always one of my pet peeves to get the signature of every parent on that handbook. Well, if they sign the handbook and then we change it, then technically we need to get their signature again. That said, I think there's got to be a certain amount of reasonableness at work here. And I think that if we do make some changes um, that are in the best interest of kids and families, that we're going to have to we're going to have to work on that. But that your question will most likely result in me calling our council um, for advice on that. But it is a legal document. Once it's signed by the parents, they sign off on what is in that document, and it's very it's a very important contract between us and the parents. So if we change any aspect of that contract. I don't, I wouldn't say it voids the con the contract, but um, as far as enforcing what we changed, we need to get their signature again, but that's a technicality. I, I think, you know, 99.9% .9 of the families that I've interacted with in Rockland um, are not going to um, get in arguments with us about things like that, um, especially since we tend to be very reasonable. Um, yeah, Alan, Dr. Kwan, I'd also say that you know we are operating under a declaration of an emergency at both the state and the local level, and that has ramifications and impacts 
any existing contracts and in fact supersede them. Good, good. I just, just a question. I just, you know, I, it's unpredictable times and I'm just trying to think about anything that, you know, that might come up that we're not anticipating. Yeah. Well, it'll be a lot. There'll be a yeah. lot of things. A lot. Every day. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm going to move, just move on. I have a right. few more things to cover in this. Um, I just wanted to, to let folks know about the school safety protocols that we are developing. It is comprehensive. Um, they're guided by recommendations from the Center for Disease Control and the World Health, Health Organization. They're going to be, um, we are working directly with the Rockland Board of Health, the Rockland Public Schools Head Nurse, and the Director of Facilities. They're, these are all uh, critical um, people in this process. Um, it encompasses everything from school attendance to what to do when a student or staff member becomes ill. So our notification procedures, our cleaning procedures, our follow-up procedures, um, expectations for cleaning and disinfecting rooms and restrooms covers transportation safety as well. It, are, it covers everything from how we will enter school to how we will leave school. We will have special food service and cafeteria protocols in place. So I'm working with Adele Leonard on that right now to um, how will the cafeteria function because it will not function the way it did when we left school in March. Um, general mitigation activities, how to wash your hands, how to wear a mask properly, how to wear um, other protective equipment that our custodians or some of our teachers may need to wear. So it covers, that, calls, it covers all of that. Um, so the school safety procedures are in development and that is something that I will be sharing with everyone publicly as soon as it is completed. But again, I want it to be vetted by a few more people before it's released, but it will cover everything and be um, exceptionally comprehensive. Um, at this time, I'd like to provide a budget update because the budget update um, really provides a context for not only what we need to do, but what we're able to do uh, financially. Because as you know, this, the, the country and the state and the town are in a financial crisis. So at a time when we are looking at all of these new things that we need to do. We are actually experiencing a budget contraction. And so those two things just do not add up. So we've been working very hard since this entire thing began um, to have as strong a budget for FY20, which we have closed out. And we are now beginning the FY21 budget. And I wanted to ask um, Mrs. Hackett to uh, share with us our current budget state. Please, and I will stop sharing my screen. Mr. Cable Murphy, can I share, please? Mm -hmm. Give me just one moment, and we'll take care of that for you. All right. You should be fine. There we go. All right, hello everybody. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. All right, good morning. Um, taking us back to, to March 16th of uh, this year, um, over the weekend after we shut down, we got together and we projected a potential $1,355,000 budgetary shortfall for the fiscal year. We are going to close the fiscal year with a $37,000 surplus, all right? Um, how we were able to do that was just through tremendous cooperation at all levels of the, the, the organization. Um, and this, well, this, this spreadsheet is exceptionally simplistic um, and in no way captures all the ins and outs and all the individual moves that, that were made, but it does provide a relative summary. Um, and by and large, our largest expense is personnel and the the personnel bore the brunt of this deficit. Specifically, we furloughed 97 general fund employees. Those are employees um, who were funded through the raise and appropriation granted to us by town meeting last year to the tune of almost $900,000. And these are approximate figures. These were my original estimates. The actuals have come in a little bit differently, uh, but very close. So 97 general fund employees um, were fur furloughed uh, and we did that in two rounds. We went with the custodians and in, in maintenance first and then we added um, 
the drivers, aides, nurses, and non-union secondly. Under the revolving funds, we also immediately furloughed the daycare and the before and after school program, and we furloughed the cafe. Um, daycare and before and after school went first, and they are the only employees who, um, as of today, are still furloughed. All right, so in total, we furloughed 151 personnel and for savings of over $1 million, and the remainder was back and forth between um, realization of savings from moves that we had implemented. In February, we implemented a hiring freeze. In uh, January, a spending freeze in February. And then we negotiated um, expenses and saved money um, on contracts um, that we had, um, specifically with our transportation company. Um, I just want to add, Jane, that they're, yes. they're only ones that are furloughed because they're the only ones that would still be continuing to work. Everyone else finished the last day of school and the daycare um, continued, would be continued through the summer. So that the is, people at home aren't confused. That is, that is correct. The drivers, aides, and nurses do not work during the summer. They were all recalled the last week of school were given reasonable assurance of employment in the fall and therefore are ineligible for unemployment over the course of the summer. Thank you. Um, it's very important to note that all of these individuals remained employees of the Rockland Public Schools and remained insured during this entire period. They all were able to keep all of their benefits and they all were continued to be Rockland Public School employees. It has impacted their years of service with the retirement board um, but that has been the only impact to them. And we're hopeful that the state will make some sort of adjustment to that um, after the dust all settles um, for um, these employees um, who were impacted. So what this afforded us to do was to be able to freeze our grants and to freeze our revolving accounts, uh, force things onto the general fund and close the books. Um, it enabled us to pay all of our special education costs which in turn will become eligible for reimbursement through the circuit breaker program for FY21 um, revenue. So this is FY20. Um, I just want to thank everyone involved, the school committee in the past, uh, Mrs. Colleen for Lizzie for what you folks did and the discipline you exhibited from taking our revolving accounts from zero balances to healthy balances that they were um, for me to walk into this job uh, made this possible. So um, a lot of good fiscal discipline in previous years that led um, to our financial health that led us to be able to weather this storm for these uh, for this the fourth quarter of FY20. Um, any questions on FY20? Looks good. No. Okay. Um, FY uh, FY21. This this slide is is busier and again and not as busy as the real picture actually is. Well not the real picture but the detail picture is. But in summary form, this part here is the same that we have been looking at, okay, um, since pretty much the middle of April. Due to re a reduction in revenue across the board, all right, we were looking at a $2.4 million deficit, close to a $2.5 million deficit. We have worked very hard together as an organization and we have decreased that deficit to just shy of a million dollars without any project, without any recommended layoffs. However, if we go down here to the detail, okay, of the 1.4 million that we've saved, we've identified to date, we have had to reduce our workforce by $1.4 million in salary. How we have done that was, again, the implementation of the hiring freeze in January that we haven't been replacing. The ones that we had to replace because they are um, SPED mandated compliance positions. We have recognized um, breakage, which means we've brought people in at a lower dollar amount than the ones that went out the door. We had two non-renewals, which are the only layoffs in that, um, in this group. Um, and that is a yearly exercise we always, we generally have non-renewals and this recognizes retirements. So again, $1.4 million, that's 
$469,000 in new positions we were going to add under the Student Opportunity Act back here in March. We reduced 469,000 in new positions. Seven teacher retirements or non-renewals, two para-retirements, and hiring freeze and breakage, 292,000 for $1.4 million in savings. Salary two is extracurricular, by and large, stipends and differentials. Um, we have reduced some of these based upon the recommendation of the principals um, in senior admin to the tune of $44,000. SPED, unfortunately, from March. Oh, sorry, SPED, I'm gonna to skip to SPED, then I'll do expenses. SPED, unfortunately, in March, has gone up approximately 300,000, 272,000. Um, and that's just a fact of life. And that's just, I wanted to also add that that could be one student moving into our, our district that needs services. That's that is student. exactly what it is. We have one student who's moved in who needs services and we've had two who went from day programs to residential. Oh. Again, this is also a cost and I'm very concerned about it. It's right now, I only have it at 272. We're gonna be facing remediation. We're gonna be facing all kinds of SPED issues next year. Yeah. Um, so this is a line item we're gonna watch very, very carefully. But as I've said to Dr. Cron, there is no fluff in any of these numbers. These are all actuals. These are our bodies. These are the people that we have now. This, there's no anticipation of growth throughout the year for SPED or salaries. All right, nor is there for expenses. Expenses, again, this one looks really simple and it's nowhere near as simple as this, but this is the end result, All right? Expenses are down a quarter of a million dollars, All right? Many went up, um, many went down, but by and large, we're down a quarter of a million dollars um, in expenses. The main adjustment has been nine buses. Um, we had 11. We had nine to begin the year last year. We went to 11. Those buses were by and large empty. We were way below um, seat capacity. And we have made the fundamental decision for nine buses um, for next year. And that was a savings of approximately 140,000. So and with those <laughs> nine buses, I just want to add in with those nine buses, that is still busing students that are sort of more than the state is requiring us to bus. Um, we normally would only have to bus K through eight. We actually bus K through 12. Right, K so, through six. K through six oh, outside sorry. of two K through six outside of two miles. I'm working on the kindergarten requirement. It, it actually, it's hard to get a, a direct answer on that, on the kindergarten question. But K th one through six is two miles. If you live beyond two miles as the crow flies. Um, is transportation. So that's something that we're working on. So even though there's 1.4 of salaries here it, um, with the increase in SPED, overall, we're close to a $1.5 million savings for a total budget of 29,281. You bring that up here. And again, our funding, there's been no adjustment in revenue. We've actually lost $46,000 um, in grants that I haven't adjusted. And I'm fine with that because there's some give and take there. So we're at, um, here's our funding, we're at a $987,000 deficit. And we, based upon recommendations, sad and very difficult, devastating recommendations by the senior admin team and the principals. There is a recommendation right now for 12 paraprofessional layoffs for $200,000 and 11 teacher layoffs for 667,000 for a total of 875,414, which you bring up here, which still leaves us not yet meeting the target at $112,413, which we're not worried about at this point. Um, so this is $875,000 um, in, in layoffs. Um, these individuals, these 23 individuals have been informally notified um, that if town funding remains as currently voted by town meeting and we receive no state, federal, state, or local relief um, or adjustments, that they are in danger of being laid off. We have not given them formal 
uh, RIF notifications, commonly referred to as pink slips, uh, because that would sever their employment and, and impact their benefits and impact their years of service. And, and again, we want to keep everyone employed and insured um, as long as, as possible, but we also wanted to be honest and direct with them and give them the opportunity to explore options if that's the path that they so cho chose. Um, and this is where we stand. And there are two huge items that are not included in this budget that are exceptionally real that we're dealing with on a you know daily basis. And those are unemployment costs and PPE expenses and additional transportation expenses for whatever model we open. None of those expenses are incorporated into this um, current state of our proposed budget for FY21. Those costs are substantial. Um, transportation, depending on the model, could be anywhere from three to $800,000 of additional cost. Um, unemployment um, is at this approximately $400,000. Uh, so we're looking at it uh, in PPE, could be anywhere from 250 to a million. Another million, couple million. So that is, and you know, everything, is, and that does not include Chromebooks. Yeah. All right, so there is a massive and substantial um, financial implication to, to strictly COVID expenses. I am working daily with, with Colleen for Lizzie and um, Elizabeth um, Biz at, at Town Hall. Um, we're working exceptionally well and collaboratively together to make sure that we're utilizing the right funding opportunities um, for the right supplies so we're able to maximize all of these grants and leverage everything that we can to A, keep people safe, and two, keep people in school, and three, keep people employed. Um, and the, the, the level of cooperation could not be better. Um, or more detailed. Um, and there are, right now, we're up to seven different funding sources that we're attempting to leverage. Uh, that's including the grants that we're rolling from FY20 to FY21. Um, and we're doing absolutely positively everything we can, but the state has given us guidance to sort of keep the, the, um, the COVID expenses in a separate bucket, which we're doing. So this is strictly the, the, the 29, 281, 341, which is $112,000 out of balance, is strictly our operating expenses. Okay. What's the cost of Chromebooks these days? Oh, the, uh, a, Chrome, a Chromebook is... <laughs> I bet uh, it's gone up. No, well, we actually had a very good meeting this morning. Um, with Tim Wells, the director with Colleen Trilizzi and myself, because both Colleen and I woke up to emails that there are Chromebook shortages nationwide uh, for parts, so none of us needed our coffee. And we have been assured that we have, we got our order in early enough and we are still on track to have our Chromebooks in by mid-August. And then didn't we receive the CARES Act grant for the Chromebooks? Yes, but now we're looking, that's another, that's a great question, great point, and there's a perfect example of how everything changes every day. Um, there's a $25 million grant available through the state right now that's based upon the Chapter 70 formula that Colleen and I are working with. There's a call at 12 on how to apply for that, and we may shift the funding from the CARES Act to that so we can use the CARES Act for something else, and we may be taking our PPE money in putting our PPE money um, into a FEMA grant, which could um, could make a difference. And you know, Biz yesterday told me, you know, order what you need, order what you need, order what you need um, to get back to school. And that's exactly what um, we're doing today. We're going to be ordering the masks and the hand sanitizer and the gowns and the face shields because we do not, the supply chain is starting to dry up again. Yeah. Uh, we've waited as long as we could to get counts and to let prices drop. They are still dropping, um, but I don't want to wait any, any longer. And, and Mr. Shaw and I and uh, Mrs. Ryan are going to be pulling the trigger on all our COVID expenses, hopefully by noon um, tomorrow, have everything all wrapped up. 
Okay. And we're tracking everything in one account, business established, accounting is established, a, a COVID account, and that's the account line that we're using for all of those expenses. They're not even running through our, our, our budget anymore. They're, they're running straight through the town. That's great. Good. Thanks. All right, so I'm trying to find my piece of paper, um, Tom, on the individual prices of Chromebooks. I will find them. Yeah, when you do, just yeah, you email it out. Just curious. Yeah, they're all ordered, though. All right. Thanks, Jane. Good news. Just a quick, just a quick point. Just a quick point, Jane. Um, great job explaining all that. Thank you. That's a lot of information and a lot of uh, sobering information for sure. I just wanted to make sort of the the quick comment that I know we're all sort of thinking in the back of our hearts that you know these numbers represent numbers on a page, but the furloughs and the potential layoffs are ex extremely painful on a human level. These are our friends. These are our colleagues. These are parents of our kids in town and it's heartbreaking to lose uh, any one of them never mind as many as we are and it's just it's 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 very very sad it's not obviously um anything that anybody's done or not done here in rockland um but great job you know facing this crisis but i just what did want to point out you know how painful this is on a human level for everybody absolutely and we still have 54 of them out mm -hmm. excuse me we still have 34 of them out mm -hmm. Um, and, and just to answer the question, there are 700, uh, um, the laptops are $734 each. Wow, oh, okay, thank you. Those are laptops, not Chromebooks. Right, yep, I understand. And that is all I have for superintendent's report. Okay, wow. thank you, Dr. Cron and Jane. Any other comments to this before we move on? How about a two minute break? We're live. <laughs> you can run off, Tom. We have to keep going. <laughs> Jane, you want to stop sharing? Oh, my apologies. Yeah. Okay. My mother told me always to share. <laughs> <laughs> share or none in the Moroni house. That's what we say. Share or none. All right. But now Tom left and we need a vote. So um let's switch we'll do monthly reports for june until he comes back um we would normally do financial reports um but we'll wait we'll do monthly reports for june we have art and music art with mrs thompson and music with mr piazza any comments i'd just like to say that um i'm happy that all of the online learning for art and um, music are still taking place and people seem to be pretty active even though um, everyone's home. I agree. I agree. Um, we'll go on to, it's hard to go on without him. Old business, um, Rogers Middle School improvement plan, second reading. We have to vote on that, but do we have any questions or concerns about it before we vote without him? Crickets. <laughs> no questions, Joe. Uh, I'll, I'll come up with something just to burn time. Um, <laughs> So on the improvement plans, Alan, I mean, I know these are a lot of these take a long time and there's a lot of work and effort put into them. Is there any impact from um, the pandemic that that that's impacted the improvement plans or is there anything that that uh, any way that that fits in within those or Yeah, I mean, to be to be quite frank, we need to start over. Yeah, right. I kind of thought I kind of thought um, we I think the fundamentals are there. The um, the core values are there. The um, the, the goals of that five-year improvement plan are valid and in place and have been driving us, but um, we've had to completely shift. Yeah. And so, yes, it's had a, it, it definitely will have an effect. I think we need to regroup and redo the plan, um, you know, as soon as things settle back down. I think uh, school will not look the same as it did pre-March, even if we were to find a vaccine next week. Um, school would still right. look differently than it than it than it did. Yeah. Should we table this for now, or? Um, I would say I would recommend that you approve the school improvement plans because at this point it's a it's a housekeeping exercise. Um, okay. We want to have a student. We want to have school improvement plans in place for sure. Um, it's a requirement, but at the same time, I think we need to recognize that those plans are are going to change. Um, in the coming months. Anyone want to sing a song? <laughs> Do 
do a ditty? <laughs> yes, I have a question um, going back, or maybe it's just a, a conversation to start with. Um, I mean, Jane, I know you guys are doing a lot of the, the cost assimilations um, for everything related to the PPE and everything, but um, the PACs all gave updates the last month or so um, where their balances are at. Um, have we reached out to the PACs to see if they'd be willing to fund any of the PPE or masks or, or any of that? Have those conversations started? Um, and I know there are some schools that are having holds on fundraising and some that are still planning to do fundraisers and I don't know if those will change but um, right. just a, a thought that came to me of could no it's an excellent to, it's, to help support some of the students it, it's an excellent thought Jamie and yes yesterday <laughs> um, yet, uh, yesterday with the the principals one of the you know uh, one of the things that they wanted to buy was not expensive uh, however it, Colleen it was one of the remote um, pieces it was one of the remote learning pieces um, it's very inexpensive. They've paid for it in the past and they would only take credit cards. Yeah, and we don't have credit cards. And so we've been trying to keep everything away from the PACs and everything running through the town hall. Um, and I said, go ahead, let the PACs buy it. You know, um, so what I would prefer is I would like the PACs to be able to save all their money when this is over, we have a really big party at each school for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, that's a good idea. I think they would love that. <laughs> you know, um, so, um, that's my, yeah, that's my hope. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, but thank you for the offer. And yes, we, we do have them in mind. And, you know, they're a huge part of our team and a huge part of, of what makes each individual school so special. Um, for the kiddos, and it's an, another piece, you know, for both the people who are involved in doing that type of thing, and for the students, and for the faculty and, and principals that we have just lost the experience of, for the, you know, since March, and and that's just another part of the really sad reality of of this. There's so many things that they fund that we really don't realize. They most of them fund the water throughout the, the classrooms, the water coolers, which we will not have this year. So that's one thing they can save money on. But they do a lot. Right. I really need to you know, maintain control of the PPE because for the, the, the safety point, I really do. Um, the Chromebooks and the PPE, just, we have to have them. You know, they, 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 they have to be here. And so we need to continue to centralize the, uh, that, those procurements. Plus, we have a funding source for that stuff. We have the CARES Act. So we are funneling all of our purchases of PPEs through the CARES Act money so it doesn't fall on the taxpayers. Right. But you know, there are times when you do just pull the trigger and try to cut the red tape and get stuff done. So we're not spending three hours on a $250 purchase. You know? <laughs> okay. All right. Mr. Mills is back with us. So let's go back to, <laughs> welcome back, you. I'm sorry. Financial reports for April, we have a cafeteria. Um, Alec, can I have a motion to accept? Approve. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye, aye. The five. Aye. Awesome. Um, moving on, we talked about the Rogers Middle School Improvement Plan. Um, we just need a vote for that, like motion. housekeeping. Motion. Motion to approve. Thanks. Second. All those in favor? Aye. That's the five of us. Thank you. Um, and now moving on, we already did the budget, so I'm going to skip past that and go on to new business for surplus equipment. Um, I know just in my own um, way of knowing um, Tim that if it has become surplus equipment, it is considered dead. <laughs> so <laughs> I know he did some earlier, and now I think this is his second round. Um, and he must not be able to revive any of this. So I will entertain a motion all, on that motion. as well. Motion to approve surplus equipment list. Thank you. I just have a question. Does he, what does he do with this, with this equipment? Is it recycled exactly. or donated or? Okay. Yes. Yes, Dawn is shaking her head. Yes, it is. Donated. Okay. <laughs> so the viewers is at home, they can't see Donna shaking her head. <laughs> And I, guess right. I, I just was curious, I, obviously he's not on the call right now, but um, 900 laptops out of service? Is yeah, the, end, of, end of life. End, end of, of life. life, okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. 
is unable, it, unable to be updated software wise. Right. So they're no longer usable on MCAS and no longer able to be updated. Yeah. Um, Plus, yeah, they, they wear out real quick. Yeah. Right. I, I will say for a, you know, we're, we're, we look at a four to five year lifespan for a Chromebook and maybe a five year lifespan on a laptop and we get far more, far more years, many more years than that out of most of them. Yeah, um, so we are maximizing. That's a good number. Tim Wells definitely takes the time to try to revive everything he certainly can short of doing CPR. So yeah. he is him and his little team. Um, yeah. So we appreciate that. All right. So we had a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah, it's mostly the time is the software. The hardware stays around, but that's another thing. Right. Yeah. All right. On to public service announcements. We'll go with our ladies first. So Mrs. Davidson. I would just say, well, i uh, like to say welcome back, Dan. And um, I know we went over this earlier, but I know the community is waiting patiently um, for the school reopening plan. Um, but just know that the school committee, the faculty and numerous staff members are working behind the scenes all hours of the day trying to present the best plans um, going forward. So just, I hate to say, but be a little patient and the plans will be announced as soon as possibly. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Mrs. Hennessy. Um, I guess I echo uh, Emily's uh, sentiments and welcoming Dan back. Um, and just looking forward to um, having some answers, right? Or, or some. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also wanted to encourage uh, any families listening, if you haven't taken the survey, make sure you get your voice heard um, and make sure you spread that word that that survey is out there um, and check your junk folders if you didn't get it. <laughs> um, uh, I, I guess uh, looking forward to the next steps and, and thank uh, Dr. Kron and, and Jane and, and Donna and everybody for all the hard work um, as well as the rest of the leadership team for everything they're doing so far. Thank you. Mr. Mills? Uh, welcome back, Dan. And uh, my comments is that uh, if you have any comments or questions or anything like that out there, call us. You know, let us know what's going on, you know, and, you know how you're feeling. And, you know, it just, you know, uh, don't, don't hold, please don't hold back. Just call us. Let us know what's going what, what are you thinking? Thank you. And have, uh, try to be safe, you know, do things right. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Biggins? Welcome back. Thank you. Um, thank you. It's good to be back. Um, it, it just, I, it, I wouldn't want to comment on being back without um, adding that I, would re I really miss, and I know this committee really misses, and Rockland really misses uh, Mr. Phelps being on this committee. Uh, best case scenario would be him uh, looking at you with a much more handsome face than mine on this Zoom call if those going forward. I wish I was still here. Um, but I didn't, I didn't um, come back because I thought this would be easy. I came back because I knew it's going to be very hard. Um, and I just hope I can be helpful. I hope I can be helpful to this committee. I hope I can be helpful to uh, Rockland schools. And I hope I can be helpful to moms, dads, and grandparents out there with any concerns that, uh, that they have. Um, this committee's done a great job, I think, from my looking from the outside in, given everything that's been going on. Um, it's scary times, and I think everyone's doing their best. Same for Alan and Jane and Biz and the Board of Selectmen. Um, I just think it's, it, it's easy to complain about hard times right now, but nothing is that nothing of this is of anybody's manufacturing. We're all in this boat together. Uh, Roppy, um, you know, rough seas ahead, but let's make sure we're all rowing in the same direction. Uh, thanks so much for your um, trust in having me back and really looking forward to getting right to work. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say that summer reading lists are out there. Um, I know we have had enough of schooling from March to June, but um, get your kids reading. I always try to get it done quick in the Moroni household. The quicker we read, the quicker we're done, the quicker we're into the pool. Um, the survey is also out there. So I encourage anyone <clears throat> to take the survey. Um, if you have questions on the survey, or you have any questions at all regarding all of this, all of us are available, like everyone here is saying, we email us, call the super's office, get our information. We are elected officials and we are here for you. That's what our job is. You're not bothering us. Um, that's what we're supposed to do. Um, we are in uncharted territory and that's what we're here for. 
Um, summer lunches are still going on. I wanted to thank Adele and her team for continuing. They've been doing this since March, um, out there every day, since March. making sure the families in Rockland, the students um, are fed, and I appreciate that. Um, I want to thank Harry Holbrook, Harrison Holbrook, and his family um, for providing ear savers to the faculty of yes. to, to wear on their masks that, um, this year at the school. Um, I believe, uh, I don't know the number, how many they were donating, but um, I thought that was awesome that they were. And I wanted to thank Dr. Harrison and his team for assuring that the seniors this year are getting graduation and their senior activities. We are looking forward to that in just a few weeks. Short weeks. Um, so I think that's very exciting. It won't be the same that it always is, but it will be. And those kids deserve their day and I appreciate that too. Um, I appreciate this team for all that they're doing. I know that you're doing it every day and without you, we would be nowhere. It takes a strong team um, to row the boat. It's not just one person. Um, so I wanted to say thank you to that. And I just wanted to say, have a good summer. <laughs> get out of the house, get some fresh air, put away your mask. <laughs> um, any questions, anything else anyone wants to say? No, motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Have a good day. You too, have a good summer. Bye everyone.